The idea and ideal um, and reality of racial military domination whose most vulgar and vicious protocols are in a kind of eclipse that is only properly understood as a kind of dissemination, but whose effects, the very order that it brings into a retroactively conferred sacred existence, remain as the afterlife of sovereignty in the regime of biopolitics, is emphatically and boisterously alive in the state of Israel and in the, in the territories it occupies. And it is perhaps reference to this idea or ideal to its continuing necessity for already existing power that helps us to explain why settler colonialism in this instance is called almost everything but that in official media and intellectual culture. This discursive exception turns out to be a reservoir for the sovereign exception. It is as if the essence of sovereignty remains available as long as it is manifest somewhere as a kind of exemplary remainder. Just because biopolitical containment often seems to liquidate the alternative, it's important to note how the assertion of the right of death and the power over life still must make its presence felt as a precondition of the liquidation of the very possibility of an alternative. One way to think about all this is to begin with the axiom that Israel has been thrust into only partly by way of its own having volunteered for the role of the exemplary remainder of sovereignty after its having taken the form of military racial domination. The exemplary remainder of sovereignty is constrained, among other things, constantly to claim a kind of exemption that, that accompanies its enactment of exception. The state that constantly asserts its right to exist, its right to have its right to exist constantly recognized by the very ones upon whom that right is built and brutally exercised. That is the one who bears the standard for the right of every other state so to exist and to behave. Such behavior is always ultimately the exercise of the right of death and the power over life that now constitutes the residue of sovereignty in the biopolitical regime. Insofar as the U.S. is itself also a settler colonial regime whose very essence and protocols are military racist domination, it shares this urge and this claim at a visceral level. But make no mistake, the state form in its various stages of biopolitical development always shares this in this impulse. What's at stake precisely are the states any state shares in Israel's right to exist, in the residue of sovereignty in the biopolitical and the traces of it that will have been born in any state or two-state solution anywhere. In the most general sense, always already residual sovereignty must respond violently to what brought it into existence, the already given constantly performed capacity for the alternative. The alternative is under duress. It must continually be refreshed and rediscovered. This might very well be to say that the alternative must always be under duress. I'm here in the name of the alternative, whose refreshment is in the anti-national international. And one of the questions I often ask myself is how discourses of globalization and more pointedly of diaspora might become more than a mode of turning away from the very idea of the international. I've been dwelling in a way that is, I recognize, quite problematic on this question, which is a question for black studies and for ethnic studies that is concerned with what the boycott of Israeli academic and cultural institutions might mean for them. For me, the justification of the boycott is quite simple. The victims of sovereign brutality have come to an overwhelming consensus in the very shadow of the state or two-state solution, whose force is redoubled in the way it looms and recedes, that boycott is the most immediate form of international support that they require. To be in solidarity with them is to enact and support the boycott. However, the significance of the boycott is a matter for me that has been a bit more difficult to think through. Arguments against the boycott that go beyond the rejection of whatever form, either of criticism of Israel or Palestinian resistance, or the some, sometimes open and sometimes veiled assertion of an assumed Israeli exemption and exception, Focus on the negative impact the isolation and assumed withdrawal of support for Israeli dissidents will have. Already a morally obtuse argument insofar as it shifts our primary political and ethical concerns 
away from the actual victims of state violence. Nevertheless, for me, much of the significance of the boycott has to do with what it might help to make possible precisely for those supporters of the Palestinians. Of course, support here denotes whatever operates in conjunction with, but also and necessarily in excess of criticism of Israel. The critique of Israel, however necessary and justified, seems to me not to be the equivalent of solidarity with Palestine. Not only in Israel, but all over the world, and particularly here in the U.S., which is, as I have intimated, Israel's outsized and enabling evil twin. <laughs> it seems to me that the boycott can help to instantiate or to refresh the alternative here, in a moment when it is under a new and unprecedented form of duress. Again, for me, that refreshment is precisely anti-national internationalism standing against the working of sovereignty and exceptionalism in its biopolitical forms. There is a particular kind of sub-political experience that emerges from having been the object of that mode of racial military domination that is best described as incorporative exclusion that settled settler colonialism instantiates. It is not the experience of the conscious pariah, as Hannah Arendt would have it. Her misrecognition of this experience is at the root of her profound misunderstanding of black American insurgency, which was not, only, which was not the unruly, sometimes beautiful, and ultimately unstable and pathological sociality of the ones who are not wanted, but was and is, rather, an unruly, always beautiful, sometimes beautifully ugly, destabilizing and auto-destabilizing sociality as pathogen for the ones whose desire precisely for that pathogen, pathogen and its life-forming, life-giving properties is obsessive and unbroken. There is a more than political, anti-political experience of the ones who are brutally and viciously wanted, to which anyone who has any interest whatsoever in the very idea of another way of being in the world must constantly renew their own ethical and intellectual relation. As someone whose social, intellectual, and aesthetic orientation is largely defined by black studies and black radicalism, which as far as I'm concerned are the same thing, I am interested in the refreshment of that orientation for which I often feel despair in the moment that is so often horribly mistaken for its triumph, mm -hmm. that this boycott as a mode of international solidarity and exchange can bring. I think that anyone who shares this orientation in its broadest sense, under whatever of its local habitations and names, <coughs> in Palestine, in the state of Israel, or wherever else, simply must be attuned to the necessity and to this specific possibility of refreshment. Selfishly, I'm interested in how this boycott might provide us with some experiential and theoretical resources that help to renew a certain affective, extra-political sociality that help to form a new international of alternative feelings. So that in the end, my remarks so far have been nothing other than a kind of long-winded preface to an apology to Palestinians for the fact that in the end, the boycott might very well do more for us than it does for you. Precisely in its allowing us to be in solidarity with you and with that richness and possibly developing dispossession and deprivation that comprises the social and theoretical resources of Palestinian life. In this sense, the apology is augmented by gratitude for the chance that your call for solidarity, which is in my mind itself an act of solidarity, provides.